Hi guys, let's start chapter 5 that is the age of industrialization. Here's a figure, dawn of the century, okay. A uh, figure 1, dawn of the century, published by E.T. Powell Music Company, New York, England, 1900. In 1900, a popular music publisher, E.T. Paul, produced a music book that had a picture on the cover page announcing the dawn of the century, which we saw in figure 1. As you can see from the illustration, at the center of the picture is a goddess-like figure, the angel of progress bearing the flag of the new century. She is gently perched on a wheel with wings, symbolizing time. Her flight is taking her into the future. Okay, so her flight is taking her into the future. Floating about behind her are the signs of progress. Railway, camera, machines, printing press, and factory. This glorification of machines and technology is even more marked in a picture which appeared on the pages of a trade magazine over a hundred years ago, which we'll see in figure 2. It shows two magicians. The one at the top is Aladdin from the Orient who built a beautiful palace with his magic lamp. So, what does this Orient mean? The countries to the east of the Mediterranean, usually referring to Asia. The term arises out of a Western viewpoint that sees this reason as pre-modern, traditional and mysterious. So, Orient mostly refers to the Asian nations or the Asian countries. Uh, then... Here, we have a figure here, two magicians. Figure 2, two magicians, published in Inland Printers, 26 January 1901. Okay, the one at the bottom is the modern mechanic who with his modern tools weaves a new magic. That is, builds bridges, ships, towers, and high-rise buildings. Aladdin is shown as representing the East and the past. The mechanic stands for the West and modernity. So, in this picture, Aladdin it represents the East and the past. The mechanic stands for the West and modernity. These images offer us a triumphant account of the modern world. Within this account, the modern world is associated with rapid technological change and innovations, machines and factories, railways and steamships. The history of industrialization thus becomes simply a story of development and the modern age appears as a wonderful time of technological progress. These images and associations have now become part of popular imagination. Do you not see rapid industrialization as a time of progress and modernity? Do you not think that the spread of railways and factories and construction of high-rise buildings and bridges is a sign of society's development? How have these images developed and how do we relate to these ideas? Is industrialization always based on rapid technological development? Can we today continue to glorify continuous mechanization of all work? What has industrialization meant to people's lives? To answer such questions, we need to turn to the history of industrialization. In this chapter, we will look at this history by focusing first on Britain, the first industrial nation, 
So we will first focus on Britain, which is the first industrial nation, and then India, where the pattern of industrial change was conditioned by colonial rule. 1. Before the Industrial Revolution all too often we associate industrialization with the growth of factory industry. When we talk of industrial production, we refer to factory production. When we talk of industrial workers, we mean factory workers. Histories of industrialization very often begin with the setting up of the first factories. So, the history of industrialization very often begin with the setting up of the first factories. There is a problem with such ideas. Even before factories began to dot the landscape in England and Europe, there was large-scale industrial production for an international market. This was not based on factories. Many historians now refer to this phase of industrialization as proto-industrialization. Okay, so before the industrialization began, there was a phase in which there was large-scale industrial production for an, in for an uh, international market, but there was no factories or industries, but there was still a mass production or a large scale industrial production. So this phase is being called as proto-industrialization. So what is this proto? Indicating the first or early form of something. So it means the early form of industrialization. In the 17th and 18th centuries, merchants from the towns in Europe began moving to the countryside, supplying money to peasants and artisans, persuading them to produce for an international market. With the expansion of world trade and the acquisition of colonies in different parts of the world, the demand for goods began growing. But merchants could not expand production within towns. This was because here urban crafts and trade guilds were powerful. These were associations of producers that trained craftspeople, maintained control over production, regulated competition and prices, and restricted the entry of new people into the trade. Rulers granted different guilds the monopoly right to produce and trade in specific products. So the rulers granted different guilds the monopoly right to produce and trade in different products. It was therefore difficult for new merchants to set up business in towns, so they turned to the countryside. So it was difficult for the new merchants to set up business in towns, and so they moved to the countryside to set up new businesses. Uh, then we have, in the countryside, poor peasants and artisans began working for merchants. As you have seen in the textbook last year, this was a time when open fields were disappearing and commons were being enclosed. Cottagers and poor peasants who had earlier depended on common lands for their survival, gathering their firewoods, berries, vegetables, hay and straw had to now look for alternative sources of income. Many had tiny plots of land which could not provide work for all members of the household. So when merchants came around and offered advances to produce goods for them, peasant households eagerly agreed. We have a figure here. Okay, figure 3, spinning in the, ninth, in the 18th century. You can see each member of the family involved in the production of yarn. Notice that one wheel is moving, only one spindle. 
By working for the merchants, they could remain in the countryside and continue to cultivate their small plots. So they could do two things at a time. They could work for the merchants or the new businesses which have come up in the countryside and the second one is that they can still cultivate their small plots. Uh, income from proto-industrial production supplemented their shrinking income from cultivation. It also allowed them a fuller use of their family labor resources. Within this system, a close relationship between the town and the countryside okay so within this system a close relationship developed between the town and the countryside merchants were based in towns okay so the merchants they were based in towns but the work was done mostly in the countryside a merchant clothier in england purchased wool from a wool stapler and carried it to the spinners. The yarn thread that was spun was taken in subsequent stages of production to weavers, fullers, and then to dyers. The finishing was done in London before the export merchant sold the clothes in the international market. London, in fact, came to be known as the finishing center. So the finishing was done in London before export. So what is this stapler? A person who staples or sorts wool according to its fiber. Then fuller, a person who fulls, that is gathers cloth by pleating. Then we have carding, the process in which fibers such as cotton or wool are prepared prior to spinning. Okay, within this system, a close relationship developed between the town and the countryside. Merchants were based in towns, but the work was done mostly in the countryside. A merchant clothier in England purchased wool from a wool stapler and carried it to the spinners. The yarn, that is the thread that was spun, was taken in subsequent stages of production to weavers, fullers, and then to dyers. The finishing was done in London before the export merchant sold the clothes in the international market. London, in fact, came to be known as the finishing center. This proto-industrial system was thus part of a network of commercial exchanges. It was controlled by merchants and the goods were produced by a vast number of producers working within their family farms, not in factories. At each stage of production, 20 to 25 workers were employed by each merchant. This meant that each clothier was controlling hundreds of workers. We have here a figure. Figure 4. A Lancashire cotton mill painted by C. E. Turner. The, the Illustrated London News, 1925. The artist said, seen through the humid atmosphere that makes Lancaster the best cotton spinning locality in the world, a huge cotton mill aglow with electricity in the twilight is a most impressive sight. 1.1 The Coming Up of the Factory The earliest factories in England came up by the 1730s, but it was only in the late 18th century that the number of factories multiplied. The first symbol of the new era was cotton. Its production boomed in the late 19th century. In 1970, Britain was importing, okay, in, 19, in 1760, okay, uh, so... By the 1730s, the earliest or the first factory came up 
and uh, by the late 18th century, the number of factories multiplied in England. And the symbol of new era is cotton. Its production, that is the production of cotton, boomed in the late 19th century. And in 1760, Britain was importing 2.5 million pounds of raw cotton to feed its cotton industry. By 1787, this import soared to 22 million pounds. This increase was linked to a number of changes within the process of production. Let us look briefly at some of these. So the increase in the import of cotton is because of some changes in the process of production. So let's see the changes. A series of inventions in the 18th century increased the efficacy of each step of the production process. Carding, twisting and spinning and rolling. They enhanced the output per worker, enabling each worker to produce more and they made possible the production of stronger threads and yarn. Then Richard Arkwright created the cotton mill. So the cotton mill was created by Richard Arkwright. Till this time, as you have seen, cloth production was spread all over the countryside and carried out within village households. But now, the costly new machines could be purchased, set up and maintained in the mill. Within the mill, all the processes were brought together under one roof. So now what happened is that in the mill, all the processes are brought together and everything was done inside the mill. And management, management is also done of all the processes. This allowed a more careful supervision over the production process. A watch over quality and deregulation of labor, all of which had been difficult to do when production was in the countryside. So now the production, it can be regulated, the labor can be regulated and the quality can also be watched or it can be regulated. In the early 19th century, factories increasingly became and intimate part of English landscape. So visible were the imposing new mills, so magical seemed to be the power of new technology that contemporaries were dazzled. They concentrated their attention on the mills, almost forgetting the violence and the workshops where production still continued. So most of the people concentrated their attention towards the mills. Here we have a figure, figure 5, Industrial Manchester by M. Jackson. The Illustrated London News, 1857. Chimneys billowing smoke came to characterize the industrial landscape. So we can see all these chimneys where smokes are coming up. 1.2. The pace of industrial change. How rapid was the process of industrialization? Does industrialization mean only the growth of factory industries? First, okay, so the first one. The most dynamic industries in Britain were clearly cotton and metals. So the most dynamic industries in Britain were clearly cotton and metals. Growing at a rapid pace, cotton was the leading sector in the first phase of industrialization up to the 1840s. So cotton was the leading sector in the first phase of industrialization up to the 1840s. After that, the iron and the steel industry led the way. So the first sector which was leading was cotton and the next sector which started leading is the iron and steel industry. 
With the expansion of railways in England from the 1840s and in the colonies from the 1860s, the, the demand for iron and steel increased rapidly. By 1873, Britain was exporting iron and steel worth about £77 million, pound, double the value of its cotton export. So the first sector where the industrialization began it would be cotton and the next sector it would be iron and steel industry then we have the second okay the new industries could not easily displace traditional industries. Even at the end of the 19th century, less than 20% of the total workforce was employed in technologically advanced industrial sectors. Textile was a dynamic sector, but a large portion of the output was produced not within factories, but outside within domestic units. So the next thing what happened is the new industries could not easily displace the traditional industries. So still, a large portion of the output was produced not within industries or factories, but outside, that is in the domestic units. Then we have the third point. The place of change, okay, the pace of change in the traditional industries was not set by steam-powered cotton or metal industries, but they did not remain entirely stagnant either. So the pace of change in the traditional industries was not set by steam-powered cotton or metal industries, but they did not remain entirely stagnant either. Seemingly ordinary and small innovations were the basis of growth in many non-mechanized sectors such as food processing, building, pottery, glasswork, tanning, furniture, making and production of implements. Okay, figure 6. Here we have a figure. A fitting shop at a railway works in England, the Illustrated London News, 1849. In the fitting shop, new locomotive engines were completed and old ones repaired. Then we have the fourth point. Technological changes occurred slowly. They did not spread dramatically across the industrial landscape. New technology was expensive and merchants and industrialists were, ca were cautious. So they were cautious about using it. So the new technology was expensive and merchants and industrialists were cautious about using it. The merchants often broke, okay, the machines, so even if they bought the machines, the machines often broke down and repair was costly. They were not as effective as their inventors and manufacturers claimed. So the machines were not effective. When, matlab, they always broke down. They often broke down and repair was costly. So it was not as effective as their inventors and manufacturers claimed. Consider the case of the steam engine. James Watt improved the steam engine produced by Newcomen and patented the new engine in 1781. So, the steam engine. James Watt improved the steam engine produced by Newcomen and patented the new engine in 1781. His industrialist friend, Matthew Bolton, manufactured the new model. But for years, he could find no buyers. Okay, but there was no buyers. At the beginning of the 19th century, there were no more than 321 steam engines all over England. 
Of these, 80 were in cotton industries, 9 in wool industries and the rest in mining, canal works and iron works. Steam engines were not used in any of the other industries till much later in the century. So even the most powerful new technology that enhanced the productivity of labor manifold was slow to be accepted by industrialists. So the new technologies were accepted at a slow pace. So we have a figure here. Figure 7, a spinning factory in 1830, you can see how giant wheels moved by steam power could set in motion hundreds of spindles to manufacture thread. Historians now have come to increasingly recognize that the typical worker in the mid-19th century was not a machine operator but the traditional craftsperson and laborer. So historians now have come to increasingly recognize that a typical worker in the mid-19th century was not a machine operator but a traditional craftsperson and laborer because even if there were new machines, the industrialists, it took time for them to accept or to use the new machines. 2. Hand labor and steam power in Victorian Britain, there was no shortage of human labor. Poor peasants and vagrants moved in the cities in large numbers in search of jobs, waiting for work. Poor peasants and vagrants moved to the cities in large numbers in search of jobs, waiting for work. As you will know, when there is plenty of labor, wages are low. So industrialists had no problem of labor shortage or high wage cost. They did not want to introduce machines that got rid of human labor and required large capital investment. So as the labor cost was very low, they do not want to invest a huge amount in machines. In many industries, the demand for labor was seasonal. Gash works and breweries were specially busy through the cold months, so they needed more workers to keep their peak demand. Okay, so they needed more workers to meet their peak demand. Book binders and printers catering to Christmas demand too needed extra hands before December. At the waterfront, winter was the time that ships were repaired and spruced up. In all such industries where production fluctuated with the season, industrialists usually preferred hand labor employing workers for the season here we have source a will thorn is one of those who went in search of seasonal work loading bricks and doing odd jobs he describes how job seekers walked to london in search of work I had always wanted to go to London and my desire was stimulated by letters from an old workmate who was now working at the old Kent Road Gas Works. I finally decided to go in November 1881. With two friends, I started out to walk the journey filled with the hope that we would be able to obtain employment when we get there with the kind of assistance of my friend with the kind assistance of my friend we had little money when we started not enough to pay for our food and lodgings each night until we arrived in london some days we walked as much as 20 miles and other days less 
Our money was gone at the end of the third day. For two nights we slept out, once under a haystack and once in an old farm shed. On arrival in London, we tried to find my friend, but were unsuccessful. Our money was gone, so there was nothing for us to do but to walk around until late at night, and then try to find some place to sleep. We found an old building and slept in it that night. The next day, Sunday, late in the afternoon, we got to the old canned gas works and applied for work. To my great surprise, the man we had been looking for was working at the time. He spoke to the foreman and I was given a job. So he got the job. Here we have a figure. Figure 8. People on the move in search of work. The Illustrated London News, 1879. Some people were always on the move, selling small goods and looking for temporary work. A range of products could be produced only with hand labor. Machines were oriented to producing uniforms, standardized goods for a mass market. But the demand in the market was often for goods with intricate designs and specific shapes. In mid 19th century Britain, for instance, 500 varieties of hammers were produced and 45 kinds of axes. This required human skill, not mechanical technology. So for the intricate designs and for the specific details or specific shapes, they need human labor and they do not need mechanical technology for that. In Victorian Britain, the upper classes, that is the aristocrats and the Borge and the Borvegi and the Borgevegi preferred things produced by hand. In Victorian Britain, the upper classes, that is the aristocrats and the Borgevegi preferred things produced by hand. Handmade products came to symbolize refinement and class. They were better finished, individually produced, and carefully designed. Machine-made goods were for export to the colonies. In countries with labor shortage, industrialists were keen on using mechanical power so that the need for human labor can be minimized. This was the case in 19th century America. Britain, however, had no problem hiring human hands. So labor was more common in Britain and less common in America. So in America, they used mechanical. Um, mechanized uh, machines we can say mechanized tools or mechanical power then we have here a figure figure nine workers in an iron works northeast england painting by william bell scott 1861. Many artists from the late 19th century began idealizing workers. They were shown suffering hardships and pain for the cause of the nation. So that's all guys. See you in my next video. Bye.